Let's take a look at a suspicious Apple Lake USB charger. I say Apple Lake because this one cost a pound from a shop in Soccer Hall Street in Glasgow. And I get the feeling it's probably not going to live up to Apple expectations. It does have the plastic film round as if it is a real Apple type product. I'm not sure the best way to get this off. I shall use a pointy object to get it off. That's probably the best thing to whiz it off. That's your unboxing experience. Actually, the full unboxing experience would have been this crinkly plastic bag it came in, which I believe Apple doesn't supply those either. Let's get down close to this. Oh, tell you what, let's uh, do some tests. So I'm going to plug it in gingerly. It's not exploded yet. This is good. Let's plug the little tester into it, which is upside down. That's not helpful. Right, OK, let's test. Oh, it's not going in that way either. Yes, it is. It's going to go in with the wiggling. It's definitely not Apple. Uh, and we'll plug in. It's putting out 5 volts. Pretty solid 5 volts. Let's put a little load on it and see where it goes to. Keep my hand away from it because I don't even know what the electrical isolation is like in this. Right, tell you what. It's currently at 0.5 amps and it's still showing 5 volts. Let's turn it up to an amp and see how it fares. Can you see this okay? I think you should be able to see it okay. The voltage is still holding. If anything, the voltage is rising very slightly. Uh, we're at 900 milliamps. We're now at an amp, and that's what it's rated at. Let's keep turning it up and see if it goes bang, or if it suddenly cuts out. It cut out just over an amp, and keeps cutting in. And out again, it's gone into little hiccup mode. And it's back. OK, that's a promising start. Let's open it up. This came from eBay. Don't ask me where I got it from. I got it a while back. It's a little load tester. I've got a few of them here. That's the first one that came to hand. I've got a spudger. I shall spudger open. The spudger might look different because it is a new spudger. Not because the other one failed, but because I've somehow lost it. So let's see how this thing opens up. It should be quite hard to open. It's not too hard to open. Often these cheap ones will open themselves when plugged into a standard British ring main, or ring final circuit as we're supposed to call it these days. Interesting construction. The little circuit board. Let's see if we can get this out. Oh, it comes out quite easily. It's got a chip on the back. Um, electrical separation. There's the output socket, there's the circuitry surrounding it, there's the main type circuitry, there's not much separation. Right, tell you what, I'm going to take a picture of this. Uh, we'll reverse engineer it and then I'll do a little high voltage test in the transformer. One moment, please. And we're back. So if you want to try and trace this out yourself, here is the top. Uh, well, the component side. Well, it's the, it's the through hole component side. It's got the little transformer, which will inevitably get hot. It's got the output smoothing capacitor. It's got the incoming supply, really ungenerous 2.2 megafarad capacitor. And it's got a little bootstrap capacitor, 2.2 megafarad, and a presumably 1 nanofarad. Does it say anything on it? 2.2 uh, nanofarads. Uh, 1 kV. Is that really going to be a class Y? I doubt it. 2.2 uh, nano, 1 kV. Okay. Right, that is the suppression capacitor. So let's take a look at the back, which I've flipped around so everything correlates. So the incoming supply comes in in these two connections here, skirts round the uh, USB output connector and goes to the bridge rectifier, comes out of the bridge rectifier and gets smoothed by that really ungenerous 2.2 microfarad capacitor. Um, the negative rail comes round here to the other side. The positive uh, goes to that capacitor, goes to this uh, very high value 5.1 megohm resistor, which is used to initially trickle charge the bootstrap circuit. That's the bit that was cutting in and out. Uh, and it also goes to the primary winding here. I shall write primary, primary, secondary. Uh, I'll just call that FB boot. I'm writing over this bit here. I shouldn't be writing over this bit here because see that little tiny, see that little tiny sort of bit there that I can just fill in here? That's your isolation between the main side and the low voltage side. It's not actually good enough. 
Really, they should have routed it out there if they were going to go so thin as that. But it is what they've done. Other things. It's using an FM3773BE uh, switch mode chip, which is reasonable enough. I've got a data sheet for that showing the schematic. It's not going to be a case of just comparing it. It's going to be a case of seeing what bits they've missed off. There's a 2.4 ohm resistor uh, shown in this orange bit. The reason for the orange is that the current flowing through the primary goes in on these two pins, the chip, and then it uh, passes through, switch through to that, and then there's a 2.4 ohm resistor and then a sense input from that to actually detect the voltage across that to tell when to cut the coil off if it's exceeding a certain threshold. Uh, there is a, a feedback winding which has the negative connection going to it, and it also has the other end of the winding goes via this diode to charge up the bootstrap capacitor which is here, which powers this chip. So initially when you power it up, this capacitor here charges up until the voltage reaches a threshold and then it will start running and if everything is okay, if, if it's not got a shunting load like I put on it there, it will then power itself. If it doesn't, it will cut back off again. Uh, this resistor here and the value of this capacitor determine the time of that startup delay. Uh, there's that little, presumably a high speed diode. I didn't check if it's short key or not. I could check if it's short key. I don't, no, I guess that's going to be short key. Let's put this through to diode test. And if it's 0.6 volts, it's not short key. If it's 0.2, uh, should I say, if, it, yeah, if it's 0.6 volts, it's a silicon diode. If it's 0.2 volts, it's short key. Let's see if I can even get a reading here like this. It's a silicon diode, just a standard one. Well, the other one's silicon as well, but it's more traditional diode. What about this one? The output diode is short. I would expect that because it's going to be dissipating a lot of power. This little diode is going to get quite hot. Okay, proceed. The other thing that happens with the feedback winding is it goes along this track here to a resistive divider that goes to ground and then goes to a feedback pin and that kind of monitors the voltage and probably regulates uh, the voltage on the secondary side. On the secondary side, we have the Schottky diode for rectification. Going over to this fairly large 470 microfarad 10 volt capacitor, it's got a little resistor across it to put a slight load in it, which is normal enough. Uh, 511, which is 51 and 10, 510 ohms. And then there is the class Y capacitor, which connects the negative side of this to the negative side and output. It's designed to provide a path for current to come back that has leaked between the adjacent windings of the transformer. But it also passes enough current to give you a tingle in the output, usually. Pops it more than a tingle. Uh, I shall do a high voltage test in this afterwards. We'll test the... I'll remove the transformer. We'll test it up to 4,000 volts. I'll maybe leave it in situation, actually. We'll see how well the little capacitor fares, too. So let's take a look at the schematic by the manufacturer. Here is the schematic. Are you going to be able to see this? It's very spindly. It's not very thick. Maybe I should have drawn it the big black pen, but I didn't. We're just going to have to deal with it. The incoming supply shows a fuse, a fusible resistor, actually. So that's missing. Uh, it then shows two capacitors, 4.7 microfarad. They've actually used 2.2. It's a 400 volt capacitor, so it's used for death beams too, obviously. Uh, it also shows the inductor and other capacitor. They're missing. That's missing. Um, it's missing one of these resistors. Instead of the 1.5 mega ohm, they used 5.1 mega ohm. Um, so I'll scrub that out. Um, and this snubber network, which is quite important to protect the transistor here, and will make it last a lot longer. That's all missing as well. So let's scrub that out. And there's also a little resistor, which is quite odd. As a crude snubbing device, uh, it's missing across the Schottky diode, uh, which would normally provide protection against a back EMF a spike on that that could actually damage the diode. Oh, and 400 centimeter fire tempo. Yes, it's got one of those, not two of them. There we go. It shows the t uh, one nano. One nano? 101 is not one, that's 100 pico. Okay, it's bigger than that. So there's the little, um, there's the sense resistor going to the zero volt rail. There's the little smoothing capacitor, the bootstrap capacitor. There's the little diode and there's the little divider coming from the uh, feedback winding that powers that chip. That is it, right? Okay, now 
let's do the exciting stuff. So I'm going to pause momentarily while I solder some wires onto the back of this. I'm going to bridge all the windings together on this side. Um, and uh, then I'm going to bridge the two connections together on this side. And I'm going to, like, basically whack it with up to 4,000 volts. One moment, please. Okay, I've hooked it up. I think we're ready for a high voltage moment. We're at 4 kV setting. It's set to burn, which means it'll just sustain the current when it starts arcing. Uh, let's go for 3 milliamps. Let's just go with a full whack and uh, begin. So let's turn the voltage up and see how far we get. So we're currently at 600 volts, 700, 800. We're up to the first thousand volts. So far, so good. 0.26 milliamps leakage, that may be through the Class Y suppression capacitor and between the adjacent windings. Now we're going up to 2,000 volts. Something just sparked. It just failed at 2,000 volts. Okay, what actually failed? Was it the transformer that failed? Oh, that has actually flashed over completely. It's not sustaining. It has completely failed. Right, interesting. Uh, right. The next thing to do is to take transformer apart. That's a failure. One moment, please. Quick update on that. The transformer may not be the guilty party. It looks like it's the safety capacitor that failed. What's the next thing that's going to fail? So I'm going to turn the voltage up here. I'm going to see at what point... So it's now arc. I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to turn the lighting down here. I'm going to take the exposure off here. That's why you have proper electrical separation, because if you don't, uh, things just arc and spark across circuit boards. But it's doing very well. It's not going through a transformer. It's just arcing across that totally unsatisfactory gap. Okay. Yeah, that's not too impressive. Not to worry. Right, let's take the transformer to bits. The unwinding of the transformer was torturous and didn't go to plan. I did record some of it in video, then gave up. But the main thing is, the outer winding was the sense feedback winding wound straight on top of the secondary, which is taboo because the, uh, the feedback winding is referenced to the mains. Then there's a layer of tape and then there's a primary winding on the inside. So basically speaking, it's just... Uh, the only thing insulating the layers is just, it's not even double insulated wire. It looks like standard thickness wire that uh, it was just copper wire to copper wire with just a layer of lacquer insulating between them. I'm surprised it didn't flash over in the test. It shows you how good that uh, insulation is. Um, how it would fare over time with thermal cycling and expansion and contraction of the windings against each other and a hot little transformer... Um, I don't know if it would fare that well with them. And it could eventually just, you know, it might start off fine, then it could go short circuit. Um, and when it does go short circuit, it would make the output live. And if you were uh, had your iPhone or whatever plugged in, not, it would be terribly happy in a one-amp charger. If you had a metal-cased phone, you would by default, let me demonstrate, metal-cased phone... Uh, if your hand made contact with that, you wouldn't be able to let go of your phone. You'd be gripping tightly onto that phone just by the muscular contraction. So not ideal. Uh, so I do not rate these. Uh, I suppose really it was a 1,000 volt safety capacitor that failed at 2,000 volts. It did manage twice its rating, but I'm pretty sure they're supposed to go higher than that. I'm not sure the exact specifications for switch mode power supplies. But the fact that the copper was just basically wound on copper in the transformer without any layer of insulation, without the double insulation, that thicker uh, sleeved uh, copper winding that's commonly used in the secondaries, well, that just gives me absolutely no confidence in it whatsoever. So that's uh, interesting, but ultimately is a case of what do you expect for a pound? Well, this is it. This is what you get for a pound. Something that is not necessarily going to be that safe and, well might damage your equipment and might damage you.